we have been um, been responsible for this place, which was given to the Dalai Lama and Tibet House is his cultural center in America, mainly for the purpose of introducing um, the Tibetan spiritual Buddhist medicine tradition in America, and. Um, but with all of its interconnectedness, it isn't really a religious thing, it's just a knowledge thing. And um, my wife Nina has been managing the place for 15 years now, since it was given to us. Lock, lock stock and barrel. My, as she always says, it's like winning the lottery with no cash. <laughs> on a big place. Just like an elephant falls on you out of the sky and then you have to manage it. And uh, she's managed it really well for all these years, and uh, we welcome you to it. And all these 15 years, Sharon Salzberg has come here to elevate our spiritual level and to teach mindfulness and to share her glorious and kind heart. And uh, so we are so grateful for you, Sharon, and for your coming here, and for all that. And also you teach, of course, at Tibet House in the City, that uh, she received the, those of you may not know, she received the Art of Freedom Award from Tibet House this, uh, two, about a couple of weeks ago, I guess. And, um, yeah. and uh, actually, about five or six years ago, in concert with Mark Epstein, Dr. Mark Epstein, we gave her a, a Menla doctorate <laughs> of uh, mind psychology and mindfulness psychology, but we don't yet have certification, so it's, it's on an astral plane. <laughs> she has a doctorate from us from up here, but that's less public. But um, we were delighted to give this Art of Freedom. You know, the Art of Freedom came from a British lord who was at the time the head of the London Times. And when the Royal Academy hosted our collection of Tibetan art that we organized for them uh, about uh, just more, like, more than 20 years ago, um, there, the Chinese consulate complained, you know, what is this Tibetan art doing there? What is this Tibetan thing? What's Tibet? You know, it's all China, you know, kind of that kind of letter. And he wrote this whole thing about how the art, Tibetan art, which is the Buddhist art of India, is preserved in Tibetan mountain there. You know, the, especially Mahayana Buddhism, but of all kinds, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. And uh, he said it's, it's the art of freedom is what it is. And he wrote this beautiful little essay, editorial, you know, to answer that. And he even said that some of the paintings here date from such and such a century, and the, and the amazing blues of the cobalt minerals that they use to like make the blue is still vivid and intense, as you can see it in the exhibition, he said. And, and he said, in that century here in England, the only thing we were painting blue was ourselves with woad when we went out for some kind of druidic ceremony. <laughs> it was really a marvelous, marvelous essay. And his answer to the sort of wish to pretend that Tibet didn't exist as an independent thing, you know, in its history. So anyway, we're, we're very delighted, and here we are back again. This is the 15th, therefore, time. Uh, we probably did several in a year, so it's probably more than 15, actually. Yeah. But 15 times we've, we've done this together, and sometimes yeah, you've done it on your own, sometimes you've brought Krishna mm -hmm. Das here. So, so Sharon is one of the spiritual directors of the place, and it's really marvelous to have her back. And since uh, the topic this time is real love, and since she has just finished a book called Real Love, which we have to wait for with bated breath until June, until it's available, uh, because of the way presses time things, um, I use you start things off. I, I completely defer to you to begin. Wow. Since we're talking about real love, and that's wow. your new book. And so wow. you're an expert on that. Well, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm always happy uh, to be with Bob and Nena and to be here. Uh, I wanted Michael to tell that story because I've always felt this is just a really special place. And uh, people often ask me to describe it. And I say, you know, I mean, it's got nice bathrooms, but that's not it. You know? <laughs> like, there's something else going on that makes it, for me, you know, a very, very special place amongst the really wonderful places that I usually get to go to. Um, and I'm, I'm just so happy to be here. I remember uh, Michael and I last year, as we were, uh, Bob wasn't feeling well on New Year's Eve, so he was in bed, but we were bringing in the new year, and I remember Michael and I saying, 
so many people had such a rough 2015. Like, aren't we happy? I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's completely meaningless in a way. I mean, it's a construct, right? This is the turning of the year. Um, mm -hmm. And being a Buddhist and a Jew, I get three a year. <laughs> you know, I have the American New Year, I have the Jewish New Year, and I have the, the Buddhist New Year, the Tibetan New Year, you know, so. Right. Uh, but it's, it's a, you know, the Tibetan New Year probably is the most reflection of something else, which would be some astronomical configuration, you know, but uh, I don't know what December 31st, you know, means. Nonetheless, it feels like it means something. And it, it feels like it's a transition and it's, it's a time of letting go. Uh, hopefully letting go of burdens we feel we've been carrying and it's a time of moving forward into the unknown, but sometimes with great resolve or uh, hope or um, determination for greater balance or greater wisdom, something like that. And so we stood there on, on the eve of, of December 31st and said, Okay, let's make it a really good year. And somewhere recently I was like, uh, I said, what did that astrologer say? I don't exactly remember. How long does it last? So I'm really happy he's coming back. Uh, so I can press him. <laughs>